Luke chapter 2, verses 51 and 52. Well, how was your adolescence? Or I guess I could say, how is your adolescence? <laughs> Mine was not so good. Growing up in a steel mill town, 28 miles north of Pittsburgh, my family had disintegrated when I was 12 years of age. Mother tried to take care of me, but she had to work. And so, pretty much all of the time, I ran the streets in Butler, Pennsylvania. I didn't get into too much trouble, not really. I was not such a bad kid. Well, once in a while. There was only one time. In fact, it may have been the only time in my life, I said it may have been the only time in my life, I became inebriated. Don Snyder had a Henry J. Does anyone know what a Henry J. car was? You ever heard of a Henry J.? Yeah. He had a Henry J. car in high school, and I was on foot, and I got Don to take me out with a bunch of other guys, and well, you know what guys do. We got a hold of some stuff that we weren't supposed to have. All I remember is I passed out in the car that night. <coughs> Slept in the car all that night by myself. And what woke me up is I think I regurgitated everything I had eaten in the previous week. My punishment was twofold. Dawn made me clean out the car the next day. And then I did what teenage boys will do, I guess, when they're in trouble. I went home to mother. Now, my mother had a lot of wisdom. We were not a Christian home at all, but she had a lot of wisdom. <laughs> She said, I know I will fix you up, David. And she gave me a big quart bottle of citrate of magnesia. Now, if you know what I'm talking about, you've done some of this in your life, too. And she told me to drink the whole quart. And yes, she guessed it. I went in the <clears throat> little cubicle room in the apartment. I wasn't seen for about three hours <laughs> as I sat in that place. And I learned my lesson. Never been that way since. I want you to understand that. Mother knew what she was doing. My adolescence wasn't so good. Did you ever think about the adolescence of Jesus of Nazareth? You see, there is nothing in the Bible, nothing, zero. You will not find anything. There's, there, is fa there is fabrications that people have come up with, fantasies that people have written and told about what Jesus did when he was a teenager, a young man. But from the time he is 12 years of age until he is 30 years of age, zero in the Bible. We know nothing, zero. We know he lived in Nazareth. We know that he was the son of a carpenter by the name of Joseph, as far as the people of that city knew. We know that he learned, as all Jewish boys would, his father's trade. And suddenly at age 30, he bursts upon the scene to commence his ministry by identifying with sinners in baptism. Jesus was not baptized because he was a sinner like you and I have been, but he was baptized to identify with sinners and to commence his ministry. <coughs> but the incarnation, we talked about it a lot at the Christmas season, God becoming flesh, God leaving glory and 
becoming a little baby, 22 inches of humanity. He who created all of the universe is now 22 inches of humanity, a little baby. But the greatest mystery about the incarnation is Jesus had to grow up. Just like I had to grow up, you had to grow up. Still need to grow up. And Luke chapter 2 tells us that he grew in four different ways. Luke chapter 2, verse 51. Now at age 12, he had been to the temple. He had been conversing with the great leaders and astounding them. And his parents came and found him there. And then it says he went back home to Nazareth to be with them. Verse 51, he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom, in stature, in favor with God and in favor with man. His first growth was intellectual. You begin growing intellectually when you are born and when your eyes are open and you become aware of your toes and your fingers. You begin to grow intellectually. You become aware of the world around you. Jesus grew in his mind, in his thinking. He grew up mentally. And it says that he grew in wisdom. Now, wisdom and knowledge are two separate things. You can have a lot of knowledge and no wisdom. Wisdom is the ability to use the knowledge that you have in the proper way. There are many people that have knowledge, but they don't have wisdom. They don't know how to use it aright. They may be intellectually brilliant as far as knowing things, facts and figures, but it doesn't mean they know how to use it correctly. Proverbs chapter 10 tells us the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Proverbs 9, 10. Chapter 9, verse 10. Easy to remember. 9, 10. The fear of the Lord, the reverence of the Lord, the respect of the Lord, the proper submission to the Lord. That's all wrapped up in that word fear. It doesn't mean to be afraid of God as a policeman in the sky. It doesn't mean that God is mean, that you're running from him in fear. It means you have a respect and a reverence for God. And that is where wisdom begins. And the knowledge of the Holy One, the knowledge of God, is where it all begins. One thing Jesus had as he grew up was a proper wisdom of knowing who and what and submissive to the Lord God. And he applied that knowledge all through his life in the right way. I don't have a lot of smarts. Even with high school, with college, with seminary, with all of that. I don't have a lot of smarts. But I hope and I pray and I yearn and I beg and I plead for God to help me to know how to use what I do know in the way that will glorify God, that will please God. He grew intellectually. Certainly he knew how to grow physically. I don't suppose being a carpenter is an easy job. I don't suppose that it doesn't take a lot of skill and a lot of strength and a lot of muscle 
to be the right kind of carpenter. All Jewish boys grew up learning the trade that their earthly father had, and Jesus grew up in that carpenter shop. He knew how to work with his hands, and he knew how to work with his head. And it gave him great strength to do the ministry that he did. I believe that Jesus Christ was a man's man. You see some of these paintings that artists have done, especially during the medieval times. He is so sissified looking, so weak and spindly and pale. That's not the Jesus that I know. I know a Jesus is a man's man. He's strong, he's muscular, he's powerful. He was a person who commanded attention when he walked into the room. He had to have been strong to withstand the crucifixion, the beatings that took place before the crucifixion. That took a real man to do that. So I believe Jesus was muscular and strong and powerful in his physique. And it's important to have a good body as well as a good mind. And Jesus did that. He grew in wisdom, in stature, as physical, and he grew in favor with God as he grew spiritually. One of the saddest things that I see in the church, not just this church, but capital C, the church as a whole, all over the world. One of the saddest things I see is people who have not grown. They have not changed. They're still hanging on to the same concepts and prejudices that they had 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 50 years ago, or maybe even almost 80 years ago. But to be able to change and be open to new truth, to new understanding, when they saw Jesus at age 12 in the temple, his parents came to him and they found him and we read that he was discussing and debating and listening to the doctors of the law, the great intellectuals of the temple and they were astounded, they were amazed at his knowledge. He had grown spiritually so much and he knew what God wanted him to do. You will know that you have arrived at spiritual maturity when you know what God wants you to do and you submit yourself to it. Oh, it's a fancy word in our bulletin on the back page, isn't it? Sanctification. Wow. That sounds, ooh, that sounds like something whole, dramatic, and great. And there are those religious bodies that teach that you are saved, and then later on, you reach a plateau of spiritual life, and then you are sanctified. You have another great, astounding, dramatic experience. I don't believe that's what sanctification is. We read it in the responsive reading. It is growing. It is changing. It is expanding. It is new horizons. It is a daily, monthly, yearly progress in your life on and on and on and you change. If you're not willing to change, boy, I know a lot of Baptists aren't willing to change nothing. It's going to be the way it always was. And I'm going to think just the way I always did. I feel so sorry for them. They're cheating themselves out of so much. When they found Jesus, they said, why were you looking, why, why were you in doubt of what I was doing or where I was? I have to be about my Father's work. I am conscious that God has set me apart and wants me to do something very special with my life. That is real growth. When you get to the point where you believe that God wants you and only you to do something great, then you open yourself up to him. grew spiritually. I want to grow up spiritually. And he grew socially. Says he not only grew in favor with God, but he grew in favor with man, with humanity. He 
had a home life. Mark chapter 6 to ask the question, is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James and Jose, who Judas and Simon, he had four brothers. And are not his sisters as plural? That tells me that Mary had a house full of kids, seven of them. And you interact with that. You learn to interact with other people through the family that you have. And what is one of the great, great sadnesses of our nation today is that we don't have good home life. It is so important to interact with parents and with children and with brothers and with sisters and cousins and grandparents. And that's how we learn to get along in the world by interacting even in our home. And so Jesus did. He grew intellectually. He grew physically. He grew spiritually. And he grew socially. And that's good, healthful growth. That's sanctification. Changing, opening yourself up to new ideas and new thoughts opening yourself up to new experiences in Christ, opening yourself up to a steady progress to become more and more and more like Christ, and then you die and you will be just like Christ. The Bible says we will see him as he is because we will be just like him. Oh, I've seen people through the years, and there are usually old people, and I see how much more like Christ they are than I am. And oh, how I want to emulate them. And oh, how I want to grow. And I want to, I'm not very Christ. As June, I'm not very Christ-like. No, I'm not. But I'm supposed to be. And I hope I'm getting there. But it takes a lifetime. It takes all of your life. Whether you live to be the age of nine or whether you live to be the age of 90, it will take a lifetime that God gives you to become what God wants you to be. Are you what God wants you to be? Are you getting there? Are you growing? Are you changing? Are you expanding? Are you being sanctified, progressing more and more as he leads you? Brother David,